Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to, to serve others and transform lives here across the street and around the world. We're glad you're all here today, and also want to welcome those who are joining us worshiping from home online. We are glad that you're joining us. We hope wherever you are, you are safe. You are also a part of our Habit of Grace United Methodist Church family. Our second hymn today, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, is not in the hymnal that's found in the pew racks. If you would like the music for that, just raise your hands, keep them up, and Chet will be glad to run around and hand you the music. Chet, right over here. <laughs> keep those hands up and he'll bring you the music. Um, we got musicians all over the space, so that's great. Today we worship God as creator as we celebrate God's gift of the natural world, God as redeemer as we walk with the risen Christ through the Easter season, and God as sustainer and justice seeker as we celebrate Native American Ministries Sunday and ponder environmental justice. Out in the narthex are some special offering envelopes. They're white on one side, blue on the other. If you'd like to make a special gift for Native American Ministry Sunday, and Sue wants one too, Chet. There we go. Yep. Um, if you want to make a special gift, you can use these. They're designed to be used for six different days in the year, so just circle the day that's today and, and you'll be fine. We have a spring cleanup day set 9 a.m. this Saturday, and... Um, I invite you to come out, enjoy the fellowship. We're going to be doing it with our Girl Scout troop. We have a lot of fun weeding and throwing mulch around. Um, so come out and, and uh, get some work done and also just, just have a good time. Tickets are on sale for the upcoming spaghetti dinner in support of our summer mission trip. Um, um, Michelle is coming. So Michelle will be here to sell tickets. So look for Michelle after worship. She's going on our mission trip this summer as one of our chaperones. There are some little forms inserted in your bulletins. They're very colorful. They're different colors. These, these are opportunities just to, to jot down your favorite hymns. If you want to use the number out of the hymnal, that's fine. If you want to just give us the name, we can look up the number. Um, try to use at least one favorite hymn a Sunday, sometimes two. My aim is to get 100 of these. That works out to two, you know, two a week for a year, and um, I got 69 so far, so keep them coming, drop them in the offering plate, please. Following worship, downstairs in the social room, there are some yard sale items available, and Janice Smalley would be down there uh, to wait upon us. The profits from that sale benefit the American Cancer Society Relay for Life. If it's your first time visiting with us in worship, uh, or you've never gotten a letter from me, uh, please fill out one of those little blue cards that's found in the pew rack, drop it in the offering plate, because we want to connect with all those who worship here with us. So friends, we're in sacred space, we're invited into sacred time, and so let's all take a deep breath in, and let it out slowly, as we let go of our daily concerns and center ourselves in the presence of God's Holy Spirit as we are called to worship by Vivian. Vivian? Please stand in heart or body. <clears throat> this day may our minds be open to you, O God. Help us listen and learn the lessons that creation teaches. This day, may we approach with humility that which is beyond our experience. Help us listen and learn the lessons that creation teaches. This day, may our hearts be stirred by the grace of the one who created and is creating. Help us listen and learn the lessons that creation teaches. This day, may our actions reflect the wisdom that we hear spoken, sung, chirped, whispered, and hummed by your creatures, O God. Help us listen and learn the lessons that creation teaches so our ways, our actions, and our patterns may be transformed. A passing of God's peace um, as a sign of the reconciliation 
Jesus Christ has made between us and God and our desire to be reconciled with others, we pass God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Please pray together. O oh God of the heavens and earth, we see your majesty in the heights of mountain ranges and your glory in the depths of the oceans. We recognize your presence, the tiniest of creatures and the greatest of beasts, the simplest sprouts, the most complex cycles of nature. In this hour, move in us that we may know our connection to all that you have created. In this act of worship, draw us closer to you by opening our ears to your voice throughout creation. Amen. As a caring congregation and a praying people, I bid your prayers this week for a family that is known to Connie and Harry. The dad, Henry, died from head, a head injury sustained after he was struck while crossing the street. He leaves behind his wife, Sarah, and children, Emma and Jack, and judging from the family picture I was sent, I think Emma's in middle school and Jack's in high school. Would somebody be willing to reach out to Connie and Harry? Thank you. I bid your prayers for Diane, the wife of Mark. Um, Diane fell Friday night. She's at University of Maryland Shock Trauma, and they anticipate skull repair surgery for her. And I know some of you would be willing to reach out to Diane and Mark. I bid your prayers for Anna, who's a senior at John Carroll. She was seriously injured in an automobile accident Please pray for her, her family, her fellow students. She and her family are known to Julie here and Sue Ellen, and I know, Julie, you'll take our prayer love uh, to Anna. 
and her family. I bid your continued prayers for David, the husband of Joyce. Uh, David's a member of our choir. He's undergoing chemo. Would somebody be willing to reach out to David and Joyce? Thank you. I bid your prayers for Sue, who's a friend of Peg and Jim. Uh, Sue's husband, son, and daughter are all dealing with very serious health issues. So, of course, that means that Sue is health advocate and primary caregiver. So, um, just keep this in your prayers. I bid your prayers for Anne, the friend of Pat and Jerry, who is battling cancer, and the battle seems to be um, going badly. And so, we want to keep Anne in our prayers. And I know, Pat and Jerry, you'll take our prayer love to Anne. I bid your prayers for George and Connie, friends of Bill and Donna who attend our early service. George is undergoing chemo. I bid your prayers for Sue's cousin Sandy and her husband George. They're transitioning to senior living care from their home of 45 years, and this has been very hard on George because he has dementia, and when you change things, then everything's disorienting. Praise the Lord, however. This last week, he has gone better, and he is settling in. He's begun to recognize the furniture and other personal items in the space. So that's giving him a sense of, of home. So we praise God for that. I bid your prayers for Ashley, who is the wife of Brian and, and the mother of Declan and Keegan. Um, okay, this is what mothers do. She is going camping next weekend with a preschooler while dealing with a painful dental issue. She needs a root canal, and it's not scheduled till after that weekend. She says, pray for medical dental healing. If you ask me, we ought to be praying for her camping with a preschooler. <laughs> but anyway, if you know who I mean, reach out to Ashley and Brian and family. I bid your prayers for Alice, who's a friend of Vivian. We've been asked to pray for healing, and so we are, and you can take our prayer love to Alice. I bid your prayers for all those who are feeling the strain of stress. It is National Stress Awareness Month, so we want to remember those who are feeling that strain. We have a number of joys today. We want to thank God. Uh, this weekend is the Havity Grace Dance Recital, which admittedly shuts everything in the city down pretty much. Uh, but anyway, we want to <laughs> pray for our dancers, but let's celebrate our dancers as well. And uh, that's a praise. Also, Ian, the son of Carrie and Bill, several weekends ago took fifth place in a ninja warrior competition and won his heat in a swim race the same day and was in Sunday school the following day. So, praise God for that. He was able to get all that in in a weekend. It's a joy to share with you that um, the Relay for Life yard sale uh, has already netted over $400 and counting. So we praise God and thank you for your support and thank you for folks' generosity. This is actually, this was given me as a concern. It's kind of a joy and a concern, but there's an Emmaus weekend, which uh, Emmaus has now been renamed Seven Mile Walk. There's an Emmaus weekend scheduled next weekend. This is a women's Emmaus weekend. So it's a, it's a retreat, a women's retreat. I went on the walk to Emmaus right when I graduated seminary, and it's, it's a phenomenal program. So we're asked to pray for the pilgrims and the team leaders next weekend. So pilgrims is what they call those who go on the retreat, and then there are team leaders. So let's keep them in our prayers as well. So with our hearts and minds filled with these concerns and joys, let's turn to God in silent prayer as we name before God those concerns and joys I've not mentioned. Almighty God, Jesus, our risen Lord, was made known to his followers in the breaking of the bread. So open the eyes of our hearts, open the eyes of our hearts that we may see Christ and announce with his disciples, the Lord has risen indeed. Heal all those, Lord, who are sick or in distress that they may find an end to their pain and be restored to fullness of life. Accompany those who are in difficult transition, because transition involves change, and change can be hard. Let them know of your presence. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of earth's resources and 
to share with everyone all of its abundance, aid the church in offering a place of refuge and hope for the poor and the stranger, just as Jesus' first disciples offered him hospitality on the road to Emmaus. Help us, Lord, to live together in peace and to share our resources that we may live together well with our neighbors. Lord God, bless those who who go forth to retreat, who come apart for a time of an intentional nearness with you. Grant that their faith may be strengthened, their walk with you deepened. Almighty God, thanks be to you for faithful souls who work to improve human life and generous folk who help them. Thank you for beauty created through diligent practice and and our amazing bodies often able to do much more than we expect. Thank you for the gifts of talent and skill and the discipline to hone those gifts. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who appears again and again in our hearts and in our lives, transforming us as disciples. In his name, amen. Uh, today's gospel lesson comes to us from the New, the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. On Easter morning in the Gospel of Luke, the women who went to Jesus' tomb find it open and empty. They are met by two angels who tell them that Christ is risen. They tell this to the apostles and other disciples, but they do not believe them. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, 
Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of our Lord. I want to invite all the children who are here today to come down front and have a seat on the front bench on the front pew here, and we're going to have a little time to share together. And if you need to bring someone with you uh, for reinforcement, that's okay. I think some are coming uh, from the balcony, and while they're coming, I want to greet those of you who are joining us online. So I want to say hello today to Emmy, Andrew, Hazel, and Iris, and to Michael, Lillian, Elena, and, and uh, Eli, and to Eleanor, Ben, and Charlie, and to uh, Ian, and Bodie, and Henry, and Charlotte, to Jasper, Maddie, and Taylor, to Breezy, Ileana, Amelia, Will, and Wyatt, and to Scout, and Max, and Zoe and to Rory, Jill, and James, and to Amira, and Autumn, and to Addie, and Emmett, and Lola, and Molly, and Adeline, and to Ashlyn, and Emmy. And if I didn't say your name, I welcome you too. We're glad that you're joining us. That's it, girls. Have a seat. You can move down a little bit. There we go. So if you look at the picture up on the screen, what, do you, what is going on in that picture, do you think? What's going on in that picture? Got any ideas? What's happening? They're eating. They're eating. They're eating together, right? They're eating dinner or lunch or something, right? They're eating together. And um, I'm guessing that you all eat together with your families, right? And not, not all the time because, you know, some of the time you're at school, like lunch, right? Some of the time you might have practice for a ball game or something and you have you can't be together, or, or your dad or m mom is working somewhere and can't be home. But a lot of the time, we sit down and we eat together. And w when we eat together, do you ever chat? Do you ever talk? Yeah, you talk together. What are some things you like to talk about? What do you talk about? Um, I like to say, um, how is your lunch or how's your dinner? Now, how is the meal, right? Are you enjoying it? That's a good thing to talk about. Do you, does, does, does anybody ever say, how was school today? Yeah. All right? Yeah. We talk about things. And when we talk to each other, do, do we talk to each other this way? Or do we look people in the eye when we talk to them? What do you think? You look at them. You look at them. Yes. Mo most of the time. And there are some people... I'm just going to say this. There are some people who struggle with that, okay? They have a lot of trouble looking at people. That's something that they, doctors help them with that, okay? So that's a thing, too. But most of the time, we look at each other. We look each other right in the eye when we're talking to each other, right? So the Bible story you just heard, two of Jesus' followers are walking along, and Jesus joins them, but they don't recognize him. Somehow, and we don't know how, they don't recognize him. We don't, we don't know if they were too upset. We don't know what happened with that, but they think he's a stranger. 
they get to where they're going, and they go in and sit down to dinner. And it says that he took bread and blessed it. So he said the grace, right? He blessed the food, and then it says he broke it and gave it to them. So he's serving them. Does anyone dish your food up for you, put it on your plate sometimes? Or you might serve yourself. It depends, right? Sometimes you pass it around. But sometimes like Thanksgiving or something like that, somebody fills the plate and hands it to you. Jesus is serving them, right? That's what's happening. And somehow in that moment, they're like, oh, that's Jesus. So this man that was a stranger, they now see as Jesus. They see Jesus is the way I like to say it. They see Jesus. They didn't see Jesus before, but they see Jesus now. Now, here's the thing. Jesus would like us as his followers to see him in other people. So, who are the people we see every day? Who are some people you see every day? Who do you see? Um, my mom. Your mom. Okay. All right. Do you ever see Jesus in her? Um, yes. Yes. See? When she makes my breakfast. When she makes your breakfast. Good answer. All right. Are there other people who are around every day? What do you think? Um, sometimes I see Granny. Grand, uh, grandmother? Yeah, grandmother. Sometimes we see her. Yeah. Now, some of you are in school. Do you see people at school? Yeah. Who do you see at school? Um, your teacher. Teachers. And um, your friends. And your friends and your classmates, all right? Do you see Jesus in all of them? Yes. yes? Okay. All right. Somebody this morning said, mm, some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. And I'm going to talk about that later because that's true, by the way. Sometimes we don't see Jesus when we probably ought to. <laughs> you know, people, mm. Anyway, seeing Jesus really is a way of saying you're important. You're loved by God. You're someone worth caring about. And that's really what Jesus expects of us, that when we look at other people, we, we are looking with eyes of love. We're looking to see that they're important, they're loved by God, and they're worth of being cared about. So that's what, when I say you're seeing Jesus in other people, that's kind of what I mean, seeing Jesus. In, so here's what I want you to do. How many of you have looked in the mirror and looked into your own eyes? Yeah. It's a little freaky sometimes to look in your own eyes, right? But when you look in the mirror and you see your own eyes, we're going to say a little prayer this week. Dear Jesus, help me see you in other people. And that's kind of a mouthful, but dear Jesus, help me see you in other people. Can you remember that for me? All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of vision, and thank you for seeing us with eyes of love. Help us, dear Jesus, to see you in other people. Help us to know that they are worth loving, worth caring for, and that they are you too. In your name, amen. So what's going to remind us of God this week when we do what? Yeah. Look at other people. We're gonna, yes? But we're gonna re- and we're going to say a little prayer about that, right? What's the prayer going to be? Um, That's a lot to remember. Dear Jesus, help us do what? Uh, see, see, see Jesus in other people, right? Dear Jesus, help us see you in other people. And what's going to remind us to, to say that prayer when we do what? You know? When you're looking... No, don't know. When you're looking where? In the mirror, and we're seeing our own eyes. Very good. That was a big one. Thank you very much. Give them a hand, folks. Yeah. In some parts of the church, and I've done it here, 
during the Easter season, in other words, during the Sundays between Easter Day and Pentecost, we focus some years on the life of the early church. And so it's, it's often customary to have readings from the Acts of the Apostles, which is about the early church. And we do that because we need to acknowledge that the early church, the church didn't just spring after Easter in, in, into form. It took time for the church to be formed. The same is true of us as Christian believers. It takes time to form disciples. And so this year, we're focusing on the building blocks of faith. The building blocks of faith. What are the commitments that we need to make as disciples that are foundational to our faith? that will help us build our faith. What are the fundamentals for a life of faith? And last week, we focused on trust and doubt, trust and doubt as things that go into faith formation. We looked at the roles that they play in faith formation. Today, we ponder sight. And we are called, my friends, as disciples, to look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. Our gospel reading, which is often called the walk to Emmaus, focuses on an appearance of the risen Christ. Now, the gospel of Luke focuses more on appearances of the risen Christ than it does on the empty tomb. It does talk about the empty tomb. But after that, it relates at least three appearances of the risen Christ. I say that it focuses more on appearances of the Christ because in Luke's account of the empty tomb, when the women return from finding the tomb empty, the stone rolled back, and, and, and they tell the apostles and the other disciples about the tomb being empty and about the two angels who have told them that Christ is risen, When they do that, Luke says, these words seemed to them, that is to the disciples, an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe. Now, let's pause there. Who is not believing? The apostles, Peter, James, John, Andrew, and so on. Jesus' closest friends and followers do not believe. And by the way, some people have said, and I think there's some, there's some truth in this, one of the proofs that Easter is not a hoax is, is that people don't believe it. You know, if it was a hoax, if it was a setup, they'd all be in on it, right? Right? but they don't believe it at first. So, okay, that sentence, these words seem to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. That's the end of the paragraph. Later that afternoon, however, two followers of Jesus are walking to Emmaus, and and I imagine in my mind's eye that they are trudging dejectedly along Turning home after Passover in Jerusalem, which usually was a great celebration, they're trudging along because the one they had believed was the light of the world has been snuffed out. The one they had believed was the hope of humanity is dead. Jesus joins them as they walk along, but somehow they do not recognize Jesus. And I've often wondered about this. How does Jesus exactly join them? I mean, did two paths converge? But in my imagination, I envisioned them as trudging along so slowly that Jesus simply overtook them because he was clipping along. Just my imagination, but I think there's some way in which they end up walking together. So there's this conversation that follows, and it is clear from that conversation that the message message of the women about the empty tomb and the angels 
has been heard, because these two folk are relating it, and that the empty tomb has been verified, because they relate that to Jesus as well, but they did not see Jesus. That's what they say. Cleopas and his companions say, they said this thing, we checked it out, the tomb was empty, but they did not see Jesus. And then a deep conversation follows in which Jesus explains the places in the Hebrew Scriptures about himself. Now, I have a weird sense of humor, but I have always thought that this was a very humorous scene. I mean, this is Jesus talking about himself in the third person to two people who don't recognize who he is. And I'm put in mind of the scene, and I don't remember if it's Huckleberry Finn or Mar um, Tom Sawyer, but in one of those books by Mark Twain, the, the boys go out, the two boys go out to an island, and they've disappeared, and the town assumes they're drowned, and they throw a big funeral, and the boys decide to go up in the balcony and listen to what everybody has to say about them, right? <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> so, these three, they get to Emmaus, and Jesus makes as if he's going to go on. Why? Well, one answer to that question is that Christ is a dynamic Savior. He is always moving on to share the good news with new people. He is pictured in Luke and in Mark as saying when folk wanted him to stay with them where they were, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So Christ is always moving. He is moving in the life of the church, and he is moving always in our lives. Another way to answer that question is that Jesus does not want to impose on their hospitality. So, Christ offers himself to us by coming alongside, but he must be invited into our lives. He does not force himself upon us. Our God is not coercive. And it's good to remember that when we're thinking about evangelism. Today on Native American Ministries Sunday, it's especially appropriate to recall that some very tragic things have been done in church history in the name of Jesus, including forced conversions. I'm not sure how a conversion can be forced, to be honest. There's a famous story told, um, I think it was um, Charlemagne who before a major battle lined all his troops up along a river and had priests wade in the river and take branches of evergreens and splash water up on the troops to baptize them en masse. Well, I'm not sure there was much of a conversion going on there. One, <laughs> one professor of mine in seminary said <clears throat> about Europe in those days, there was a massive need for Christian education. <laughs> Yes, I would say so. And if that's, your, if, that's your, if that's your baptism, you've got a lot of follow-up to do, right? So at dinner, when Jesus blesses, blesses and breaks the bread, their eyes are opened and they see Jesus. They see Jesus. They hadn't seen him before, but they're seeing him now. And and I don't know whether that was an act of God in opening the eyes of their hearts or, or that they saw Jesus do something familiar, something they may have seen only a few days before at the Last Supper, but the truth is they see Jesus. And then it says Jesus vanishes. And that has always bothered me. It's like, uh, put yourself in their shoes. They've just connected with Jesus. This is wonderful. Here's the risen Christ. Yes, he indeed is risen, boom, boom, and blah, he's gone. Why? Again, perhaps because Christ is dynamic, moving on to appear to someone else. Now, the risen Christ can appear to as many people at the same time as he wants to. This is not a physics lesson. Or maybe, maybe it's because they have what they need which is a little bit like last Sunday when we, we talked about Doubting Thomas. 
I want to see the wounds of Christ, and he is given what he needs. Maybe in this moment, they have what they need. They've seen the risen Christ. That's enough. Because, right after that, they are so filled with his presence that they run all the way back to Jerusalem to share the good news. Only to discover when they get there that the risen Christ has appeared as well to Simon Peter. So that's the second appearance in Luke, and there's a third one. Luke wants us to know. Luke wants us to know through his accounts of the resurrection and the ascension of the risen Christ that Jesus is universal. Jesus is all over the world and no longer limited to Palestine. As at least two of the Gospels say, the women at the empty tomb are told, He is not here, He is risen. Jesus is not here, he is risen. <clears throat> he's not here because he's everywhere. He can't be tied up and bound or boxed up by us, and sometimes we want to do that, right? We want to box up Jesus and kind of limit God and say, well, I want God this way, or I want God for these people, but not for those people. No, no. Jesus is everywhere. So, friends, we are called as disciples to look for Jesus, for only by looking will we see him. And so we're challenged, as a corollary to that, we are challenged to look for Christ in the folk around us. Sometimes he can be hard to see. A colleague tells this story on herself. A few, some years ago when the emergency rotating shelter was started, the winter shelter here in Hartford County. This is when the rotating shelter was still going around to various churches, and we weren't putting folk up in, in hotels. There was one rather large woman who was a regular, regular, year after year in the emergency shelter. And she had this habit of often asking the volunteer staff, so these are church folk like you and me, she would ask them for money because, as my colleague said, she had an amazing array of grandmothers and grandfathers who kept dying out of state and she needed to travel, if you get my picture, right? As a result, she was often shunned by the volunteers. Even pastors can grow cynical over time. Now, the emergency rotating shelter was being hosted by a church my colleague was serving at the time, and it and it happened to be either Palm Sunday weekend or Easter weekend. She couldn't remember that. But a significant weekend. And this woman came early to the sanctuary of that church where the pastor was preparing for worship. And she welcomed her, I think somewhat dutifully, she welcomed her to stay for the service. And the woman stayed saying, I need to be here. I need to be here I need to be reminded again. I need to be here. I need to be reminded again. Don't we all? Don't we all? It was a reminder to my colleague that Christ lives in each of us. Mother Teresa famously said, I see, I see Jesus in every human being. And because of that, she served the poorest and the sickest souls on the planet. Friends, we are called to see Jesus and those around us. It is also true and comforting to know that Christ is present to us all the time, even when we don't know it. Even when we don't know it. Cleopas and his companion realize after Jesus has vanished that their hearts were burning within them as Jesus was walking with them on the road, opening the scriptures to them. In other words, they were being blessed even before they knew it was Jesus. They could well have said, as others have, look, look, see Jesus? Jesus is with us all the time. In fact, if we think about the arc of that story, Jesus is with this pair of followers on the road to Emmaus a long time before they know it. In fact, he's with them far longer 
When they don't know who he is, than when they do, because then he vanishes. Christ is doing good in the world. Christ is doing good in people's lives before they can name him. That is another good thing for us to remember when we're doing evangelism. It is often more about identifying the love of Christ already present than taking Jesus to folk. Christ does not need to be imported into the world. Christ is here. And it's often more important to listen as folk tell their own stories of faith and life. And finally, we are challenged to show Christ to others. Now, in our gospel reading, the pair from Emmaus are inspired by their meeting with the risen Christ to run back to Jerusalem. They had to have been tired if they walked all the way to Emmaus, but they want to share the good news. And I imagine in my mind's eye, that their demeanor and their attitude and their body language and their tone of voice must have surely been different from when they left Jerusalem and their friends to go to Emmaus. And that in and of itself is evidence that the risen Christ has met them because their lives have been changed. Friends, we're called to be Christ for others. And that's a little bit of a radical statement because we're not infallible as Christ was. But we are called and challenged to live so that others will see Christ in us. We're called to show Jesus to others. So friends, we are called as disciples to look for Jesus around us, including in others. We are called to recognize the Christ right beside us and be comforted and inspired and encouraged by that presence. And we are called to show Christ to others so that they too can see Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let's stand in heart or body as we sing together just a closer walk with thee.
Please be seated. As the ushers wait upon us for God's tithes and our offerings, let us offer the fruit of our labor in God's service, and let us respond with gratitude in our hearts for God's bounty. Let us join our hearts and voices as we pray together our prayer of thanksgiving. Creator of all we know and all we don't know, as we bring our gifts this day, help us trust you more. Forgive us when we think our future lies in bank balances and the accumulation of stuff. Remind us that through Jesus we have come to trust you, for you raised him from the dead. By our gifts and through our actions, help our lives reflect that trust to others. In the powerful name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Following the closing blessing, we always have the opportunity to remain in the space and, and meditate as we hear the postlude. And just a reminder that our benediction is a responsive uh, blessing. In God the Creator, we are blessed and gifted. In Christ the Redeemer, we are saved and made whole. 
In the Holy Spirit, the sustainer, we are empowered to work for justice. Go in peace, and may God's peace go with you. Amen. Amen.